<coughs> so let's start. I guess Jason still was looking for some people. I think Jason is looking out in the hallway for if anyone else is just hanging outside and want to come in. Uh, but we can quickly start with introductions in the meanwhile. So, so we'll start with um, who we are. So, so basically myself, uh, Saket Kumar. Um, I work as a UI UX lead at QD42. Uh, his uh, Piyush, uh, he works as a technical ar architect at QD42. So, so basically, uh, today we'll be talking about. Uh, so today's session is more about. We'll be talking about uh, modern advancements in the mobile web uh, and diving into one of its major features: service workers. Talking about how to use them in your site and making your website more appy, more more like a mobile app, and then with all kinds of tools to debug it. Um, followed with a small demo. Um, so, firstly, uh, starting with uh, mobile web versus mobile app. Uh, I'll start with a use case here. Like, uh, you have a scenario where you you are in the um, scenario where you have to book a ticket and you don't have any mobile application with you. So, what would be your preference about, uh, will you go and download some uh, application and uh, uh, download the application to book the ticket or you'll just go to the mobile site of that uh, uh, ticketing agency and book the ticket? Uh, I guess uh, because uh, downloading a mobile app would take you like a lot of time, a lot of uh, mobile data as well. Let's say uh, any app would be around 10 MB or something. Hmm. So it would take time to download the app. So what would your preference be? Would you like directly go to the website and book a ticket given the UI is same in both the cases? You have the same UI on the app and the same UI on the web. Which one would you go for? The web. The web, right? I think that's one for the that's not frequency that you need. Yeah. Uh, even the stats, um, stats is the same thing. Uh, out of 10, 10 uh, 7 out of 10 people will go for the mobile web, and only uh, 30, uh, 3, 3 out of 10 will uh, go for the downloading the application and then go for the ticketing. But when we uh, see the stats from uh, uh, so when we see the stats from the uh, app stores, uh, like uh, um, this is the uh, stat from uh, App Store, Google App Store, uh, and it says uh, more, more and more application being developed, and similar is the case with the Apple uh, App Store. Uh, we can clearly see more and more uh, applications uh, being developed and uh, so people rather than focusing on developing uh, mobile uh, friendly web and uh, rather than uh, making a mobile friendly web they are going and developing applications uh, more. So uh, can you think of why this is happening? Why? Uh, any reasons like experience with the uh, as an experience as in what what kind of experience you're talking about? So it's very smooth. I heard something from there. Better uh, UX. Better UX. Okay. <coughs> you can have a better UX in the mobile web as well. Make your site more uh, uh, responsive and then. Yeah. Uh, speed. That's one good reason. Yeah. Uh, your apps would work offline as well, yeah. but a web would not. Hmm. So yeah, uh, we can speculate a few reasons for that. Uh, like um, uh, your um, the product owners or the developers, uh, they don't want users to have the tab experience over um, and in their application they can do that clearly. But for mobile web, they will have this tab experience. 
and then uh, again offline enabled enable the mobile apps uh, enable you to have offline data on your uh, devices but uh, then again uh, this web uh, if we are relying on web that won't won't be the case uh, then if you uh, think of the uh, push notifications which we don't have in the uh, for the web but uh, for applications we can clearly have this uh, we can update your users on the basis of any um, update in the um, application um, push notification or simple notification uh, also you have this um, splash screens which are a good way of branding of your product uh, so uh, these are the uh, and there are many more uh, reasons like uh, uh, you have more uh, access to uh, this performance and then uh, like uh, I think low level hardware would be one thing yeah so you don't have access to hardware via mobile web right yeah, yeah and uh, in 2010 this uh, wired published this blog in uh, about uh, when the app world was growing, uh, stating the web is dead as mobile application were the future for all uh, with all these new features which mobile web did not have had. Uh, but again, uh, in uh, later in 2014, seeing the trends which users uh, were uh, following, uh, which users were uh, using, uh, even for um, us users were more. Uh, liking uh, where traffic was more on uh, web so uh, then again uh, they came up with this uh, trend as even even the features were great for mobile apps um, the um, they had some overhead of downloading that app application to have that experience so uh, users were forced to download their app uh, application from the app, uh, app store to the mobile uh, and then uh, have that experience. So downloading and install was an overhead. So, uh, so still users prefer mobile web over the app, at least as per the data which we saw earlier. Uh, so progressive web apps uh, are the new way of strategies to develop your web app uh, mo mo mobile friendly. Uh, we can take an example of uh, Flipkart, an Indian e-commerce company, uh, among uh, which was among the first adopters of this. Uh, they had mobile applications for the product, but they still found out that the traffic was more for mobile web, and even. Uh, even more than their uh, desktop website. Uh, so, so to enhance the user experience for their users, uh, clearly that uh, if you go to a mobile web and then you, if you give a pop-up to go to App Store and download the application, that's not a good UX. So, uh, so to enhance the user experience, uh, they adopt, adopted this uh, strategy of pro progressive web apps. And they released uh, flipcartlight.com which is clearly uh, similar to their mobile app. And uh, you, so uh, for this, uh, you don't have to, um, the users don't have to go and then uh, download uh, uh, Flipkart from the App Store. They just need to go to flipkartlight.com and they'll have this uh, experience, uh, which is responsive, which works f even, uh, which works faster. Even the uh, network is bad. Even uh, this works fine for uh, networks like 2G or Edge um, and has uh, features like push notifications, splash screens. Uh, so to get the mobile experience for uh, uh, Flipkart again, you don't have to download these. Uh, you just need to go to flipkart.com and then. Um, so um, uh, in, in this talk, I'm not going to uh, we are not going in detail with uh, progressive web apps. We are just di uh, diving into one browser feature, uh, service focus, which would enable us to have features like offline content, push notification, etc. Uh, so before anything, uh, I'd like to um, play this video. Mm.
this volume. So uh, I think this case would have happened with almost everyone, right? Like stuck up on a loading screen, waiting for it to load, 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 right? So yeah, service workers would help you and eliminate that or at least uh, enhance its experience in some way. Uh, we'll take a look at that in details. So yeah, uh, so service workers are uh, basically a uh, browser features uh, which is uh, recently been added which has been recently been added and then uh, work is still in progress uh, currently latest browsers like Chrome and uh, Firefox they supported but still uh, uh, there are things to come in and so and they so basically it's a it's a worker thread uh, working parallelly to, uh, to the um, uh, the network thread. So, and you you don't have access to the DOM here. Uh, uh, so, uh, so the uh, so I'll talk about the features. So it has features like offline web. Mm. Uh, then. Uh, and it, it it enables your uh, website to be functional in case of slow connections, uh, even uh, like Edge and 2G, which we uh, talked earlier. And then uh, uh, it it gives you a programmable cache. Um, so earlier uh, uh, we had this app cache, uh, but that was. Uh, that was very limited. Its, its functionality was quite limited, and uh, it was um, you, it was static. But here you can now uh, have a full control over the cache, which uh, and uh, you can script your cache. Um, then uh, you ha you have this uh, background processings like uh, uh, you can notify uh, get the. Mm, have some tasks running in the background, like uh, um, you can uh, sync users' activity later on, uh, or uh, show the functionality like geofun, uh, push push notifications and geofencing. Uh, so, so these are the features. But uh, with uh, like every um, great responsibility. Uh, uh, with every new power, you have a great responsibility. Uh, like uh, in here, uh, service workers have uh, are only uh, available with HTTPS networks uh, because um, it uh, it uh, because see service workers uh, they they lie between uh, your uh, your user or the client side and then the um, uh, this server. So they uh, this serv if anybody uh, having the access to service worker can have uh, can easily intercept your network uh, request. So so uh, it's um, again then uh, since HTTP is not uh, an encrypted uh, thing, so uh, we only uh, so it is only uh, available with HTTPS. Uh, so that uh, any uh, transfer data transfer is uh, encrypted. Uh, 
mm, then uh, so we can uh, so the uh, pillars uh, so four pillar of uh, service worker would be um, it needs to be it has a uh, scoping url scoping um, so we need to scope uh, mention the scope of the uh, service worker where uh, our uh, uh, service worker scope where, where it had to uh, pick all the resources uh, and then uh, doc uh, so and document uh, matching and then in, it runs on uh, same origin um, and then uh, ah, it has a separate uh, thread of ex execution and, and has no DOM access. So uh, we, now we'll uh, dive into how to work with service workers and then um, I think uh, Piyush will take on. Hey guys. Um, so, uh, till now we have covered like what service workers can do for you. Uh, we haven't seen how it works and how would you actually write code that would allow your browsers to uh, intercept your network requests and everything. We'll dive into those now. So, starting with... Uh, uh, how this thing works. Okay. So, starting with... Uh, the life cycle of a service worker. So how? So what are the phases? What are the phases uh, in the life cycle of a service worker? So initially, when your web page loads, uh, it doesn't have a, anything uh, like a service worker installed on it by itself. So the first thing that happens is your service worker goes into an installing state. So installing is something wherein you would ideally go ahead and pre-cache something. So let's say uh, you have your website and it has a couple of static resources like your CSS files, your JavaScript files, uh, something that, um, that could be called as an application shell, um, something that a user would see as a skeleton. Uh, so how many of you have used Facebook applications? I, I think everyone would have used it, right? So when you open it, instantly what you see, you don't see any data instantaneously, you see a loading, um, uh, you don't see a blank screen, instead you see uh, placeholders, right? and you see the header, right? So that's called as your application shell, something which is your skeleton application without any data. So pull out your data from your application and pull out the skeleton. So skeleton is something that you would pre-cache, okay? So that's something that you will do in the installation step. So once, it's insta once a service worker is installed, it could go into either of two states. Either it could go into an error state or it could activate. An error would happen in case it failed to uh, cache a resource or um, something returned a 500 error. One of the resources it returns a 500 error or you're not an HTTPS at all. It would return a, it would go into the error state and then doing a browser refresh would restart the installation state. Okay? So far good? Good. Uh, once it goes into the activate state, so that's where the service worker would take control of your website. Okay? So till it reaches the activate state, a service worker is dysfunctional on your website. Activation is uh, an, a state wherein you do a couple of other things as well. So for example, uh, you have service worker version 1 running. Okay? You had a couple of things which you cached earlier. Now you made a couple of updates to your website. Now let's say you added one more CSS file and one more JavaScript file. Okay, you would want them to be pre-cached as well, right? So that's something that you would do inside your activate event. Okay, so activate is something that acts as a that that acts as a place where you could clean up your cache, you could rebuild your cache, those sort of things, right? Because activation is something right after which service worker would take control of your website. Make sense? Cool. Um, after going into activate state, it, could, it would ideally go into idle state if nothing is happening. If you do a fetch request, it would go into the, uh, go into the fetch state and return back to idle after doing the, its processing. Or it could just terminate once it's done with its job. Okay? Um, moving on to a next slide. 
um, it's a very simple slide which talks about how connectivity could affect your web app. Okay, so in the case of good connectivity, it's a simple network fetch and a normal response which users see on their browsers. But in case of a bad or slow network connection, the network fetch would happen, but uh, it would lead to ideally a timeout or a DNS lookup failure, right? Which is a bad UX. Uh, the user would again be stuck with a loading screen and doing nothing. So let's see how service worker would save the day for, for users. So service workers are something that, sit between, that sits between your web page and your web server, okay? So any request which is going from your web page to the web server would pass through the service worker. So see, this is where it becomes, uh, so as Saket talked about, it should run only on HTTPS. That's a specification because uh, it could control any and every request which is passing from your web page to the web server. So let's say you have an e-commerce website, users fill in the, their credentials, their credit card details, and if a hacker gets control of the service worker, they could intercept all of these details and reuse them. With HTTPS, all of this data would be encrypted and uh, would be of no use to the hacker, right? So yeah, um, let's take a look at this flow diagram. Um, the request, it, uh, so let's consider a fetch request, which is happening for some URL. Uh, service worker would first of all intercept it, it would look for this data, for this uh, fetch request in the cache, in the browser cache. If it finds it, it would return a promise object which will pass back to the web page, web browser. So in this case, uh, there's no hit to the server at all. So even if you're offline, you would be able to see some response, right? Um, in case it doesn't find it, so with, uh, how many of you are familiar with JavaScript promises? Okay, cool. Um, so yeah. Uh, with promises, it could either resolve or it could reject. In case of reject, uh, it would, you can program your, cap, program your service worker to look for this, to, do, to perform another fetch request for this URL to the network. Now, the request goes to the server and the response is sent back from the server to the web page in this case. So it works both the ways. Even if you're offline, the user is able to see the data. Even if he's online, he sees the fresh data. Okay? So yeah, um, we'll be diving into the code base now. Let's see how service workers would actually work. Okay, how would you actually um, register a service worker or um, how would service workers take control? What code is responsible for that? Okay, so um, in, the, in the right sidebar you see the code that says um, if service worker is in navigator. So navigator is, the, is a browser object, okay? provided by browsers, okay? Uh, now, if your browser supports service workers, it would have the service worker attribute in the, in the navigation object. Otherwise, it would not have that. So the very first thing is you should definitely check if your browser supports service workers or no. We'll uh, take a look at the, at the slide wherein we will talk about which browsers support service workers and which do not, okay? Um, so yeah. The first step is to check, for, check if your browser supports service worker or no. The second step is to register a worker, okay? Now, uh, the second step is navigated or service worker or register. So you're registering a worker. Now, your sw.js file is what, will which is what is going to control your network request and everything, right? So all of the code related to your worker would go inside service worker .js, sw .js file, okay? Uh, the second argument to this, to this is an optional scope. So uh, for service workers, so for service workers to work properly, it needs a scope. So it says that I will work, I will control all of the requests which fall under the scope. So if the scope is slash, it's clearly going to control any and every request which is, uh, which is going to be there on your website, right? Um, let's say we put the scope as slash sw, it would, for, it would control any request which, which starts with a path slash sw. Okay? And then again, uh, it's, it again is returning a promise, and if it resolves, it goes into the then function, and if it rejects, it goes into the catch. Okay? So I check for the browser support. Uh, 
scope is defined by that. Now the second step, so the first step was registering a service worker. Over here we registered a service worker, we created a worker file. Now this worker file is registered with your scope slash for your current domain. So let's say our domain is uh, nola.qed42.net, okay? Uh, and we registered our service worker.js file on root scope. So what happens is any request which is which is going to which is going to be passed to the server will pass through the service worker.js file now. Okay. Now uh, we talked about event we talked about events that uh, service worker does have right the install event the activate event and other events right so if you need to do something on one event you can attach a listener to that event your custom listener wherein uh, so as we talked earlier that service workers are completely programmable cache so you could program it the way you want so let's say we want to uh, pre-cache a couple of resources on install event so we would go ahead and add a, a listener to the install event and um, do a couple of operations inside it. So the, the first thing is uh, install is basically used for pre-cache. Um, app shell we already talked about. Um, okay. Before we go to the activate, you see the function over there which says event.wait until. Okay. So service workers also provide you a way for your, for your service worker to stay in a state until or unless it has finished its job. So anything that's inside your event dot wait until, until or unless that completes, your service worker would not move from install to activate or error state. Okay? So you can basically say that pre-cache all my resources and then move to the next state. Okay? So uh, that's where you would use event dot wait until. Um, activate function, we all, activate event we already talked about. It's mostly used for the cleanup of caches, cleaning up old cache. Um, the next step and the most important one is intercepting the, your network requests. Okay, so service workers provide you with an uh, API to do that. So um, you would again attach a event listener to your fetch event and do intercept your request, do whatever you want to do with that request, whether you could return basically an empty hello world response even for any other pages by intercepting these requests. Uh, we'll take a look into uh, how you should intercept requests or basic caching strategies which we have in place. Um, so yeah, discuss, talking about basic, basic caching strategies, we're going to discuss only two of them today. Uh, the first one is offline first, wherein uh, all of your requests get served from an offline cache first and then it's looked up in the network. So that uh, in the first time, when you, when you hit a web page, you get a stale response. In the background, service worker would pull fresh data and update your cache. So basically, the first, the first request would give you a st stale information. But if you're online, the next refresh would give you uh, the latest information. So yeah, offline first, um, I think we already talked about most of these. So it's mostly useful in case of uh, single page apps or applications wherein you have data separate and your uh, view layer separate. But yeah, it works with Drupal as well. We have built a demo, a short demo. Um, yeah. So offline first, so the very first thing that you do is you pre-cache, you describe your resources which you want to pre-cache. So let's say in this use case, um, we are defining a cache bucket, which is called as uh, decon nula, and the static resources which you want to cache in this cache bucket. So um, it's always a good practice, sorry. It's always a good practice to have separate cache buckets for different kind of resources. So um, you could have both the cache caching strategies in a single service worker. Let's say you could have a cache, a cache bucket which is going to follow an offline first approach and another cache bucket which, is going to, which, which would follow your uh, network first approach, right? So you define two cache buckets in that case. Define your static resources in one of the buckets and your dynamic resources into the another bucket and uh, initially pre-cache both of them but uh, in case, but when you're writing your fetch event listener, you describe two different ways of handling your 
both cash buckets. We'll take a look at the how to do that as well. So yeah, in this example, what we're doing is we're defining a cash bucket, a couple of static resources, and uh, attaching another event listener to the install event. And inside the install event, we're using one of the APIs which, are provi which, is provided by which is provided by service workers, the cache API. So this would allow you to write data into your cache, into your browser cache. Okay, so cache.addall, what it does is it performs requests for all of the URLs in that array, in the static resources array, and cache them in the browser cache. Okay? So yeah, the first part is your app shell and uh, event.wait until will wait until unless your resources are cached. Um, the second step would be processing your requests. So uh, you add a event listener to your fetch event, and uh, there's a function. There's again a function called event dot respond with. So this is again provided by your browsers and by and provided by service workers, which is again provided by your browsers. So uh, you could choose to respond with with data which is pulled out from cache rather than from the network. So if you take a look at the function uh, serve from cache, what we're doing there is we're doing a caches dot match for the current request URL. If the cache if the, a match is found, we do, a, we do return a response from here directly. It doesn't, the, res, the request doesn't even hit the server. And in case uh, we don't find a response, in this case we are just returning, a, redirecting users to uh, an offline.html page. Which, um, so again, um, talking a little bit off the topic here, but yeah. Um, when you, when you talk about service workers, the need for service worker would differ, would vary per application. You would never have a same kind of implementation or a generic application for, implementation for all of your applications. It would always vary. So in this case, we are redirecting users to offline.html. In some cases, you would want to uh, update the cache as we talked about. Update the cache in the background and uh, present the users with the fresh data on next, on next request. Okay. Um, another, uh, another interesting uh, cache strategy is serving from network first. So what we do here is uh, we replace the function serve from cache with serve, serve from network. And uh, in this case, what we're doing is we're doing a fetch request on the, on the, on the request URL and we update the cache first, and then send back the response. Um, one interesting thing to note here is we are doing a, uh, we are performing a clone on the response object. Can anyone take a guess why we are doing that? Why do we need to do that? Yeah. So it's a uh, mutable object, so the caching process is going to corrupt it somehow. Yeah, sort of similar thing. Uh, so it's a readable stream, basically, which could be consumed just once. So either you could respond back to the server or you could cache it. So to cache it, we uh, create a clone and just cache it into the browser and return back the actual response object. Make sense? Um, and in case it fails, we are going to do a lookup in the cache and present users with a stale copy of the page. So are you guys able to visualize what I'm saying? Uh, I know it's difficult for, uh, just by reading the code, but yeah. Um, if you've got any other custom scenario or handling the cache busting, which is very, very important in case of service workers, you need to be very specific when you're bust, when you need to, uh, basically, um, invalidate your caches. You need to be very, very, uh, clear about that when you want to do that. And it again depends on your application needs. It's not generic. But still, there are a couple of utilities which are available right now, which allows you to burst caches. Um, so for all of you, service worker is completely flexible and it's programmable cache. So go ahead, code your own logic for bursting the cache or uh, handling your own custom caching scenario. Um, another important aspect of service worker is uh, how or when, how do you update it? So 
your service worker is running. So Saket already talked about service workers as separate thread, right? Now, what he meant by a separate thread was your web pages would load, okay? But service workers would run in parallel. It has nothing, it has no control over your DOM. It cannot do the DOM manipulation. It doesn't have the power to do that. Uh, it's running separately from your website. So that's, the re that's one of the good re reasons it could do the background processing. Even if your website is not running, your service worker could be running. You get the idea? So even if, if you don't have your tabs for your websites open, service worker could still work in the background or, and perform jobs. Now, the tedious thing is how to update these things. Like, this is once installed in your browser. Now, how would you update it? Because a lot of users are already running these service workers on their mobile apps, on their web apps, sorry. Right? So, uh, service workers do provide you with, uh, with a way to do that as well. Um, let's consider a use case wherein we are going to split our cache into two parts. Uh, we're, we're going to split our cache into JavaScript resources and CSS resources here. So the first step would be you update your service worker code base. And once you update your service worker code base and it loads on the browser, uh, the browser would automatically detect that there's a change in this file and it needs to reload. Okay? And if the check succeeds, I mean, if, uh, if the service worker is a new file, if there's a difference between the, uh, if even a byte of difference is there in the size of the file, it would fire install event for the service worker again. Now, the interesting part is here, uh, once the install event is fired, the service workers would go into waiting state. Now, what waiting state means here is uh, they would not install. They would not uh, update your cache buckets or update your caches or delete or do any operation on your caches. Now, it would wait until or unless all the instances of your service workers, previous service worker versions are closed. Because there are other tabs, there could be other tabs on your browser which are open, which are being controlled by the previous service worker and uh, you would never want a user to land into a scenario where and he sees an inconsistency. Like one of the tabs is behaving another way and another tab is behaving in another way. You would never want that, right? So service worker would go into a waiting state and stay into the waiting state until or unless your, all the current versions of your service worker are closed. So once they're closed, uh, the first refresh of the page would trigger the install event again, and then it would go into the activate state. And activate is where you'll hook in and again you'll uh, basically do your cache processing, cache busting. You delete your purge your old cache, right? So that's where you'll do all the things. One of the overheads over here is the browser checking for your service worker.js file on every request. So you could again control this using your HTTP cache headers. So you could set a max age for, for this file and it would not be checked for that duration. Um, updating service workers. So yeah, this is the code example. So what we're doing here is we're creating two different buckets, JS bucket and CSS bucket. Um, one of the resources does, one of the buckets would hold the CSS resources and another one would hold the JS resources. Uh, yeah. So uh, you update your service worker.js file, which was, the, which was the first step. You update your install event and you basically now create two different buckets and cache data in the two different buckets for your CSS and JS files. And the next step is activate. So in activate, what you're doing is uh, you're going to create a whitelist of your caches. So basically, uh, this is the logic which we have done. You need not follow the same logic. What we're doing here is we are busting the old cache. We are deleting the old cache buckets. We're de deleting all the cache buckets apart from JS bucket and CSS bucket. Right? You would not want to have browser holding the old cache data, right? And uh, one interesting thing here, um, suppose you want browsers to take control of your service worker which is getting installed currently. You want it to happen instantly, even though other tabs are there which are open, which are being controlled by the previous service worker. 
So in that case, service workers provide you with an API to do that using event.replace function. So you could just call event.replace function inside your event install event, and service workers would go into activate state rather than going into the waiting state. Okay. Um, browser support, so Chrome 40 plus, Opera 27 plus, Firefox 44 plus, um, Safari, the support has come for the mobile browser, but it's not in yet for the web browser. Uh, sorry, uh, desktop browser. I, it's not in there yet, I think. And you can always check this, the browser support at uh, the URL mentioned below. Now, there are also cases, there are also APIs for which there are polyfills which are available. So polyfills are nothing but uh, small JavaScript libraries which you could inject to add additional functionalities for a website which is, which is not supported by a browser. So uh, there are polyfills which are available to do that as well. That's again available at the same URLs, a service worker ready by Jay Kakabel. Um, tools and tooling and debugging. So um, yeah. So obviously when working with service workers, you would have, it's a pain to debug service workers, which I have experienced in like last week while I was preparing the demo. So yeah, uh, there are a couple of tools which we came across. The very first one is uh, the Chrome dashboard, which allows you to see the, all the service workers which are installed on your browser currently. So you could go to Chrome, service worker internals. It would show you a list of all the service workers which are installed on your browser. You could emulate your events from here right away. So you could uh, either unregister a service worker right from here or you could start the service worker and perform your push notifications, perform your fetch operations right from here. You don't even need to open the website for that. So see, the, the, this is the power of service workers being running in a separate thread. Um, local development, it's a pain. Uh, if you don't have an SSL certificate, you cannot work with service workers. But yeah, uh, with Google Chrome, you could uh, treat an insecure origin as a secure origin using this command above. Um, network requests, so any network request which is going, to, going through a service worker would have, uh, would have the size column saying that it's coming from service worker. Okay, um, Chrome DevTools is again a good place to uh, do your debugging. So if you inspect, if you open your DevTools for a page which is c controlled by a service worker, there would be a service worker which you could inspect in the service worker tab. And again, you could add breakpoints and when your service worker runs, uh, it would show you a stack of your, all your variables and everything. Um, there, so, the code which we saw right now, the examples which we saw right now, it, ha it included a lot of code to do very simple, simple stuffs. So uh, there's a library called as Service Worker Toolbox. Now let's take a look at the third example. Now all, that code, all the code says is toolbox.router.get slash all the requests, basically slash asterisk, it means all of the requests. So for all of the requests, global.toolbox.cache first, use the cache first strategy. So in order to do an offline first application, all you need to do is just write this piece of code and include the service worker toolbox library, rather than doing all of those mumbo jumbos which we did. Um, the two common use cases which we came across while preparing the demo. So by default, your service workers would uh, go ahead and fetch a, a anonymous response. It would not set the, send the cookie back in the, back in the request. So there's a flag which you could set credentials true. Uh, if, you, if you send a request with credentials true, your cookie will be sent along with the request headers and you'll receive an authenticated response. Uh, if you need to cr cache cross-origin requests, you could pass it a, uh, another flag called mode. Now, mode by default, is, it's set to coarse, so it, it respects the cross-origin request sharing in principles, but if you could set it to no cause, and it would still fetch a response for you from a different origin. The only difference here would be it would be an opaque response. Uh, 
by an opaque response, I mean that the, you, the, response, the response that status you would never get to know if, if it succeeded. <laughs> but if it passes, it, you will have the data in the cache. So uh, the demo, uh, quickly talk, talking about the demo, what we're going to do here. So we were building the a camp website for Drupal Camp Pune, and we, we were also experimenting with service workers, so we thought that why not give users an offline experience? Users were demanding for an app, so we were like, let's build a mobile web, mobile web app rather than building mobile apps. So we experimented with uh, service workers, and uh, we allow the users to access the website offline right now, uh, provide an app-like experience. Uh, the users can add schedules to their, uh, can uh, use the add to schedule feature even though they're offline. So what happens is when they're offline, they hit add to schedule, uh, the data gets stored in the index DB of the browser. Once they get off online, this data gets synced back and the user receives a notification on his cell phone that uh, your uh, session preference has been synced successfully. Um, Drupal enhancement, which we had to do, uh, there were a couple of routes which we had to build. The very first one was, uh, the very first problem for us was to fetch the, to pre-cache the, the aggregated CSS and JavaScript files. Um, because in Drupal, we cannot fetch the, we do not have a direct way to get the name of the service, get the name of the CSS and JavaScript aggregated files. Those are like random hashes generated, right? Uh, that was one of the problems, so we created a new route in Drupal 8 to do that. Uh, the second one was, uh, so we were using flags for add to schedule feature, and we had to write a custom route to handle the background sync operations, because the data need to be posted back to the Drupal server. Um, the third thing was caching the session and sponsor URLs, so there was uh, no direct way we had to, uh, we had, for getting the list of nodes, the node IDs. So we created uh, two different views with uh, REST export format and session.json and sponsors.json, which were returning as the JSON objects. Uh, hook page attachment alters, uh, hook page attachments alter uh, to include the service worker JS file and uh, manifest.json. So we also integrated, uh, integrated the progressive web app uh, concept into this. Um, cache strategies which have been implemented are offline first, network first, uh, slow connections, in case of slow connections, the offline first kicks in, and it again uh, works well, and there's an offline page which redirects. So uh, I'll quickly go through the demo. I don't think we have much of the time left, but yeah, let me just quickly. So, whoops, what just happened? Sorry? Slides? Yeah, slides are public. Yes, yeah, slides are public. Uh, this website. Website. Uh, yeah, uh, this one? No, no, this site is public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll share the URL as well. It's, uh, I'm not very sure if internet is working well. Let me quickly open that directly. Whoops. So yeah. Um, if you could browse this web page from your cell phone on an Android Chrome browser, it would look much better compared to the demo which I show you here. So yeah, um, let's take a look at the service worker which is, let me actually mirror my display. So I'm actually going to deregister the service worker which is in, uh, in action right now and purge all the cache which is creating. And there is 
thousand and index DAB. Okay, cool. So I'll hit a refresh. So the first refresh, it's going to uh, register my service worker, do nothing else. The service workers are not taking control of your website right now. The next refresh would make service workers take control of your website. Whoops. So see, uh, it stopped because uh, there's another tab which is open, which is being controlled by my previous service worker. So I'll need to close this tab first. And then we register it. So you saw the switch, then switch from inst installing to the active state. So yeah, it goes into the inst installing state and then into the active state. And in the meanwhile, our cache. So these are the resources which, are, which we are pre-caching. Um, there's some dynamic web URLs which we are pre-caching, which is your uh, node IDs for your uh, session pages and your sponsor detail pages. Uh, the assets uh, are your CSS and JavaScript files, which are which are your aggregated CSS and JavaScript files which are getting loaded on this website. So they have been cached as well. So this is what a normal user will see when he's online. Let me see if I'm logged in. Yeah, I'm logged in as Piyush23. Now let's say we go offline. Okay. We're offline, the flag says it's offline. <laughs> so yeah, let's do a refresh. The page still works. The images, they're not getting loaded and they're, that's why they are replaced with a uh, static background image which I'm doing. This is something again which, are, which we're handling by our service workers. Uh, let's see, let's browse through the website a little bit. Go to sessions. This is a list of, list of sessions. Sponsors, it works fine. About page, venue, venue. My schedule, we haven't cached this page. So my schedule doesn't appear. But at the same time, we're caching my schedule page when a user hits it for the first time. So let's, say, uh, let's go online and hit my schedule now. OK? Now we go back offline. The my schedule page works, right? Another interesting thing to note here is uh, what we did was when you're online and you go to the sessions page, the active schedule feature, it works the way it should uh, using flags. Okay? And you see this, the button is green. As soon as you go offline, these buttons would turn gray telling a user that uh, you're offline right now. You could uh, basically add it to your schedule, but the data would get synced back only once you get back online. Okay? So let's try adding another item to our schedule. Oops, sorry. Um, it's in the slide. It's nola.qed42.net. Uh, use HTTPS. Yeah. So as soon as you click on add to schedule, you see this pop-up uh, which uses the Chrome API. It's asking for... Uh, it's asking you if your Chrome should be able to send you notifications or no. If you allow the data, it gets stored in your index DB. So yeah, the session ID, the user ID, and the action it should perform. These, this data, it gets stored in your index DB for the time you're offline. As soon as you go back online, this data will get synced back. Hold on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> okay, finally we went online. And you see this notification, we got the notification that your preference for your sessions has synced successfully. This data gets purged out from your index DB. And now if you go ahead and visit your My Schedule page, you should ideally see the session in your sessions list. Yeah, there we go. So yeah, uh, this example, uh, I would have loved to do a code walkthrough as well, but I don't think we have much of time left. Um, but yeah, going back to the slides. Oh yeah, one more interesting thing. So since we couldn't do the demo on the phone, we recorded uh, the implementation of P42 
PWA with the application as well. So the, the user logs in by the browser. He can choose to add this item to the home screen. So this is what installable web app means in terms of PWA. So as soon as he added it to, it to the home screen, it gets installed like a normal mobile application. When you hit it and when you try to browse it, if someone who doesn't know Drupal, they would definitely say that it's a native app. It's not a mobile app. So I've tried this with a couple of my colleagues, and they were like, you built an app for the Drupal camp, Pune? So yeah, you can browse through the, is it stuck? No. So yeah, you can uh, browse through the website like a native app right now. Yeah, um, this is the home page. Uh, let's go to the sessions page. Now, you see the same buttons over here. Now you go offline and try adding something to your schedule. The Chrome will ask you here as well if you want to allow users to receive notifications or no. Next step would be you go online. As soon as you go online, you'll see a notification appearing on your phone which says that your preference has been synced successfully. And then you browse to your My Schedule page. And there you'll see the uh, the session, uh, it appears in your My Schedule page. So yeah, that was about the demo. Moving back, Whoa, what happened to this? Okay. So yeah, uh, the resources that we used for uh, the preparing the slides are down below. If you want to try it for yourself, go to browse that URL. Uh, the code base that's available at in the GitHub repo down below. If you want to read more about service workers, uh, the, these are a couple of URLs which you could always refer to. And uh, any questions which you guys have? Yeah. Yeah. If you're doing an offline app like the one mm -hmm. you just showed, um, <clears throat> would you recommend uh, you know, caching full HTML pages for the 20 sessions, 50 sessions, or making each of those uh, REST requests so that- REST requests, I would say. Okay. That so way, your, your site is going to not, you know, you, and the question I have is if you preload the whole page, mm -hmm. then um, your site will still work even without JavaScript, you just won't get service worker integration and so right. forth. If you make it REST requests, then your site's only going to work with JavaScript. You've got a lot more JavaScript going on on the client side, but mm -hmm. you're downloading a third as much data or less. Yeah. So how do you decide what trade-off to make there? Yeah, so that's the reason I said that uh, I, would, I would personally go for a, a REST, REST endpoints, mm -hmm. so pulling out the data. So this way it makes, it makes my life very easy. I can separate out the app shell, and I can separate out the data. So uh, a user would initially see an app shell, a header, and a, probably a, a GIF animation. But as soon as the data lo loads in, I, uh, I populate them. Apart from that, I could do a lot more as well when I uh, use REST endpoints. Like uh, doing background sync becomes very easy. So let's say a user is browsing this web page on a slow connection, and there's a new item which has been added. Now, pulling only one new node, uh, pulling a uh, couple of data related to just one node is relatively simpler for me compared to pulling out the entire, entire listing page, right? Okay. And then the demo site you're just showing, mm -hmm. uh, is that built on Drupal 8 then? Yeah. Sweet. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, hi. If service worker is running in the browser on the mobile, um, mm -hmm. what happens? If you are offline, do something, close the browser, do you mm -hmm. would the notification still get yeah. through? Yep. So the notification runs regardless of whether the browser's running? Exactly. Okay. Because service workers are a separate thread from your browser. Yeah. Any other questions? Can you make a quick comparison to BigPipe? 
Uh, big pipe is entirely a different domain compared to service workers. Agree, 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 agree. Yeah. Overlaps, I mean. yeah, so the way I would see is big pipe working uh, along with service workers would like really pump up a website to what extent I can't even imagine. Okay, uh, what I heard about the caching, mm -hmm. uh, what can ser service workers do besides the caching? Let's say I have a, a mobile, uh, um, I have a code for mobile using JavaScript, and when the um, uh, <coughs> cell phone's screen gets off, mm -hmm. that it doesn't work because right. it's JavaScript. Uh, can we make it uh, work uh, using service workers? I didn't fully get your question, actually. Um, so basically, you're saying that when your mobile screen is off, uh, your JavaScript doesn't work. But would service worker work? Is that your question? Yeah. Uh, yes. I, ha I have. Let's say I have a, um, a call that um, every 10 seconds uh, um, checks with the server mm -hmm. using JavaScript. Mm -hmm. But when the script gets off on mobile, um, let's say Android stops it. No, so it depends on what you're doing with your JavaScript. If you're doing some DOM manipulation, that's not possible with service worker because service worker doesn't control your document. Uh, so let's say, um, let's consider one of the use cases. Which, I need a pull request. A service worker cannot do it. Yeah, it can do the pull. It can do a network pull. It can do, do a network pull in the background, even if your screen is off. Okay, that's good. Yeah. The there's one interesting use case, by the way, with service workers, which I was again planning to demo. But uh, so, uh, uh, how many of you know about geofencing, right? So, uh, service workers is a very interesting use case for uh, websites which are going to sh display different data around different geographical locations. So, as soon as you move from one place to another, service worker would, in background, pull data according to that geographical location and present you with that data. So it's right on the move. So let's say if you divide this New Orleans into sectors, into uh, geo, uh, geo, geofence the locations, uh, let's say you put French Quarter in one of the fences and put uh, downtown in another fence, you move out of downtown and you'll see a notification on your cell phone which says that you've moved out of downtown and uh, this is the data which uh, the data would be refreshed basically. So, service worker does that even the screen is off? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, any other questions? No? Um, thanks, guys. Uh, feel free to evaluate our session and put your comments on the URL below. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening.